Taverna reminded me of the days I was in Dominican Republic and thought we were doing great missionary work. I was so young and foolish. I pray the Lord have mercy on those I talked to. <laughs> How's everybody this morning? You're all still there? I'm here. Um, for some of you, it's maybe the first time I've been up here. This is my third time here. Uh, sharing my heart, this has been a tough one on me. Because, uh, you know, when the Lord does surgery on you, it's for your own good. But uh, is it a happy time when he's cutting? No. no. So I, I pray that... Uh, that uh, perhaps some of the things that, that uh, the Lord shared with me during this time, that perhaps some of it may be a benefit to you all because uh, the Lord really moved on me to give it up, the willingness to give it all. And when I first moved, when uh, Sonia and I first moved to Tennessee, we were really thrilled to leave the city of the suburbs and find the freedom of country living, the fresh air. What else is good about country living, huh? Fresh air, quiet. quiet. What else? No traffic. That was the first thing that caught me. But look at all the traffic, one car a day. <laughs> you know what really, really thrilled me about country living? The who? The labor. That was thrilling, but I had a tractor. <laughs> and that was thrilling to me because I'd never had a tractor in my life. Oh, you know what was really thrilling to me was the stars. I'd never seen so many stars in my life. I looked at Orion, and there they were, the familiar, you know, the heads, the feet, the belt, and the, the thing. I said, wow, I didn't know there's so many stars in between each one of those bright spots. So I thought, I'm, I'm really in heaven, or close to it anyway. You know, I'm living good, I've I got a good diet, I'm ve vegan, we've been, what, vegan for almost eight, nine years. But something began to happen that kind of snuck up on me. Because when I moved here, when, we, when you've, some of you may have noticed this, well, my wife did, but when I first moved here and became a member of your church, I was 180 pounds. Hey, well, I've kind of gained a few. Uh, I'm over 200, but uh, this is on a vegan diet now. So what happened? Uh, I have a sweet tooth. So my vegan goodies included dairy-free cheesecake. Yes, almond delight ice cream. And um, I was blessed. And my wife really got good at baking bread. Okay, and some of you have bought it her bread, right? <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I kind of like that a lot. So uh, I'm a result of her, her love, but um, plenty of wholesome vegan breads, lots of sugar. But uh, Sonia saw it coming, but I didn't. It was so gradual, so subtle. And, uh, but uh, my Lord placed, put it in my wife's heart to say, it's time to give it up. I said, what, what? What should I give up? He says, you're having, you're eating too much sugar. And I would like to have you around a little while longer. So it's time to give it up. Well, I was faced with a terrible choice. <laughs> you know, should I fill my belly with sugar? All that was organic, by the way. <laughs> Healthiest I could find. But how do I give up something that's so habit forming? Sugar, it's, it was really rough on me. Sh should I obey my belly? 
or repent of my idolatry because it took a while for me to figure out what was going on. And this is what the Lord had been dealing with me and submit to the love and charity of my loving wife, bless her heart. And that's the struggle I face even now as I'm speaking to you. Shall I yield to the flesh of delicious dairy-free desserts? Well, on the other hand, shall I repent of my idolatry, submit to the merciful kindness of Christ, and give it up, give it up. Because it took a while for me to understand that it, was, it wasn't a sugar problem. It was a sin problem. If you would, open with me to Ezra. Ezra and Nehemiah wrote the last two books of history in your Bible. We're going to go and explore some of the last chapters of a very important moment in Israel's history. Ezra chapter 9. I'm going to have to summarize for you because we don't have time to read all two chapters that I want to focus on, Ezra 9 and Ezra 10. This is going to be a hard one for me. It's going to be a hard one. But it must be done. You see, giving up the hardest things will reap the greatest benefits. Giving up the hardest things will reap the greatest benefits benefits. So let's continue, consider this account. If you will, we'll look at, we're just going to do the, four, the first four verses. And I think you'll be able to figure out what went through the huge emotional impact that it had on all of Israel. I'll read to you here. Verse 1. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands doing according to their abominations. Even the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites, for they have taken of their daughters for themselves, for themselves, you hear that? And for their sons, so that the Holy See have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. You get that? The hand of the princes and the rulers have been chief. What was his response? I rent my garments and my mantle, he says, and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down, astonished. When then assembled unto me every one that trembled at the word of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. Can you imagine what an impact it had on Ezra? He sat there all day until nightfall, until the evening sacrifice. Well, when the Holy Spirit convinces you you're wrong, It'll shock you. When the Holy Spirit convinces you that you're wrong, that you're wrong, it'll shock you. Like it did Ezra, I pray, and it, as it did to me. But when I look at this, I see myself. And I have a hard time to admit that I have strange wives. It's a hard thing to admit that I have strange wives. Why do I hold on to these things that represent everything reprehensible in my inner life? The people of the land offer only strange wives. The daughters of men always appear fairer to the children of God. I believe there is a deeper spiritual significance to each of these peoples of the land and of the world. Let's view in horror the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Every clan practiced the most degrading and devilish religion full of idols and lasciviousness. And I submit to you today, each one represents the dark side, the ugly side of unregenerate men. 
you look at their names, you can look it up historically or look at the original language. I've come up with a brief for each name. For example, the Canaanites or tra traffickers. They're the ones who call you up on your cell phone or on your phone and offer some great advice on what to buy next. The Hittites were terrorists. Need I say a little? The Perizzites were exhibitionists. The Jebusites were threshers. Ammonites were inbred. Moabites were incestuous sons of Lot. Egyptians were two-faced. Amorites were publicity seekers. Well, each one of these, I believe, Paul summarizes as flesh seekers and kingdom crushers when he addresses the Galatian church. So listen how he calls out these strange wives of each clan, the Canaanites, here in chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. They may be very familiar to you, but I don't know if you've connected the Canaanite tribes with these words. I connect with myself sometimes. But it reads, verses 19 through 21 of chapter 5 of Galatians. I'm going to read two versions because it punches home, punches home. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. The works of the flesh are these, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murderers, drunkenness, revelings, and the such like of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And the New Living Translation is a little more succinct and a little more explicit. The same verses, verses 19 through 21 of Galatians 5. New Living Translation, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, ouch, your lives will produce these evil results, sexual immorality, impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, participation in demonic activities, hostility, quarreling. We don't do that here, do we? Outburst of anger. We're the most softest people in there, right? Selfish ambition. Divisions. Divisions. Ooh. The feeling that everyone is wrong except those in your own little group. Hello. Envy, drunkenness, part, wild parties, and other kinds of sin. Let me tell you again, as I have said before, that anyone living that sort of life will not will not inherit the kingdom of God. Is intimacy with these wives worth losing your inheritance for? What do you think Ezra's response should be to Israel? Complacency and compromise? What should Ezra's response be? Well, a warning I would give them is be careful when things are going too good. Be careful when things are going too good. Well, you see, when Ezra brought that band of 50,000 men from Israel, they made a successful trek back. They had the blessings of the king. They returned to their homes. They have begun the morning and evening sacrifice. Their enemies have been silenced. They have rebuilt and dedicated the temple of the Lord. Even the walls of Jerusalem were rebuilt. Homes have been repaired. Life was back to normal. What could be better? So why was Ezra so upset? What caused him to pull his hair out? We find the reason and found in the book of Moses, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 4. This is alluded to. And this is what he had in mind when Ezra found out that even the clergy were marrying strange wives. Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 4. Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 4. And I'll read it for you. 
When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and have cast out many nations before thee, here they are again, the Hittites, the Girgashites, and the Am Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor shall mer show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. Verse 4. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. And so the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy you suddenly. Why does God hate the things, the things, yes, the things that we love? Well, because the Father knows exactly what would destroy his children. I ask you, are you his today? Are you his child? Well, as Ezra looked through the eyes of faith upon all this apparent abundant blessing, he could only see complete and utter failure. Why? The people were certainly religious. They had all things going for them. They were at home, they were worshiping, they were in church every Sabbath, faithfully. What could be so wrong? Well, here's the answer. They had the form of godliness but denied the power. The power to change the inner life. See, and that's what that verse really talks about. That's what that verse talks about, the inner life. And so Ezra points only to two major factors that really bothered him. First was they were doing commerce on the Sabbath. But that's very bad. But what was worse? What was worse? They mingled the seed of a priestly nation with the lives of lascivious women. That's very, very bad. So, in the midst of apparent success, Ezra saw the coming judgment of God. If the nation does not repent, Ezra knew best. Father, our Father in heaven knows best. And so, as we move to chapter 10, we see the response. Chapter 10 of Ezra, you can go back there. I'll read for you just the first four verses. I challenge you to look at this whole section again when you get home and see if it rings true for your own heart. Let us dwell then on these first four verses. Ezra chapter 10, it's just the next chapter over. Now, when Ezra had prayed, and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God. Can you, can you picture this? Picture that. Before the house of God, weeping and casting himself down before the house. There assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children. For the people wept very sore. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now for let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them, according to the counsel of my Lord, and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God, and let it be done according to the law. 
Arise in this matter. Arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee. We also will be with thee. Be of good courage and do it. Be of good courage and do it. Who should step up during this remorseful repentance but a man named Shachaniah, actually in Hebrew is Shachaijah, which is a contraction from Strong's H7931 and H3050, which means Jah has dwelt. In other words, he is intimate with Yahweh. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't clergy. He wasn't a prophet. He was a man like you and I who took a stand and offered a, 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 a solution. And he presents this plan of salvation that cannot be ignored. I see five points. Confession, consolation, covenant, commandment, encouragement. Confession, consolation, covenant, commandment, encouragement. In that one statement of his. Confession, which was marrying strange wives, which breaks the covenant made with God. Consolation, the only hope for Israel, which is in Christ the Messiah. The covenant, a promise to divorce or sever all from all worldly connections. The commandment, that is to obey the law of liberty and love. The encouragement comes from Emmanuel. God with us, Christ with you, the hope of glory. This is what we must do. Here we have this godly man whose very name means intimate with God. He gave a passionate cry of confession, consolation, repentance, and penitence. Only admitting guilt and surrendering self brings reconciliation. Only admitting guilt and surrendering self brings reconciliation. Some of the hard things I had to leave behind was my understanding of the law. You see, as a Sunday Christian and a Pentecostal, we always thought that we're not under the law, not understanding the power and the grace and the love that is in the law. That was my excuse for doing bad things. Another was the Sabbath, of course. And admitting that I was wrong was really hard. First thing I thought was, well, what did my mother think? She thinks I'm going to join some cult. But it was what God wanted me to do. Think of the prodigal, the prodigal son. When he decided to leave the hog food behind and come to his father in repentance, saying, I'm not worthy to be your son. I'll be a servant for the rest of my life. I'll give it up. I'll give up pretense, give up presumption. I'll give up pride, give up prejudice, give up power. I'll give it all up. This is what we must do. We must divorce ourselves of these chains lest we lose the kingdom of God. So what is divorce? But a device to separate us from our unbelief and rebellion? Rebellion is a context of Christ's response to the Pharisees' questions regarding divorce we find in Matthew 19, 3 through 12. It was not supposed to be this way. Our hearts were not supposed to be hard, but were soft, where his commandments could be written and dwell. Nevertheless, sin casts its ugly shadow upon the beauty of man and wife. Divorce is a terrible thing if you've been through it as I have. It is a cutting of the flesh and the bone of the soul. 
It is extremely painful. And it hurts everyone. Everyone. But is not this thing what Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians 6, 6, 17? 2 Corinthians 6, 17, when he says, and he's quoting from, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye, and touch not the unclean thing. And I, see, what does God say? I will receive you. Remaining in sin will suffocate you. Coming out from among it will deliver you from the lake of fire. Now with these conditions meant, separation and consecration, you get that? The Father promises to receive us. Hallelujah. I will. God says, I will receive you. Allow the king of glory, when he says, I will, to come in. Allow him to come in so that you can rejoice as a psalmist rejoiced. When he storms the ramparts of your heart, let him come in. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the, this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Hallelujah. For those who may not recognize it, that's Psalm 24. I challenge you to surrender the captain of your salvation. Let him hoist the banner of grace upon the walls of your pride and prejudice and claim victory over every corner of your castle right where you are. Give it up. Give it up. You cannot have what you hold on to. You cannot have what you hold on to. If you want something so bad it hurts you, then it's probably not a good idea to hang on to it. Oh, but it tastes so good. Oh, do I love that vegan cheesecake. Oh, but it feels so good. Being around him makes me feel like a princess. Huh? Being around her makes me feel like a king. So let us hear what Jesus says about holding on to things. We find it in Luke 14. This is probably one of the toughest passages that Jesus spoke to me about. I pray perhaps he would have the same impact. Luke 14, 25 through 33. Luke 14, 25. I'm sorry, Luke 14, 25 to 33. You've got to picture this scene. There's a great multitude following Jesus. Uh, I always imagined what it was like for this crowd when Jesus suddenly turned to them and began to speak these words. Uh, and I pray it startled me, and I pray it startles you the same way. It says here in verse 25, and there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Verse 29, And lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, and it was not able to finish. Or, what king? 
going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an embassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath. You can go along his merry way and do what he wants. What does he say? He cannot be my disciple. I looked at this very carefully and I finally found that the best comments on this section very hard section for me, was found in our own Seventh-day Adventist commentary. And allow me to read a few paragraphs from this commentary because it struck me hard and I pray it does something for you all. It cannot be ignored. First, it states regarding the statement, if any man come, the commentary says, Jesus now sets forth the four following principles that discipleship involves cross-bearing, Two, that the cost of discipleship should be carefully counted. Three, that all personal ambitions and worldly possessions must be laid at the altar of sacrifice. And finally, number four, the spirit of sacrifice must be maintained permanently. How long? Permanently. The commentary on hate not his father. And this is interesting. The scripture usage makes it clear that this is not hate in the usual sense of the word. In the Bible, to hate often should be understood simply as a typical oriental hyperbole, meaning to love less, as in Deuteronomy 21. The fact stands forth clearly in the parallel passage where Jesus says, He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Got it? This striking hyperbole is apparently used to make vivid to the follower of Christ the fact that at all times he must make first in his life the kingdom of heaven. Again, in regard to material possessions, the governing principle is a matter of what we make first in life. It gets worse. The commentary continues. Cannot be my disciple. It reads, not will not, but cannot. Whoever has personal interests that take precedence over loyalty to Christ and devotion to his service will find it impossible to meet the requirements Christ makes of him. At all times and under all circumstances, the call of the kingdom must take precedence. The service of Jesus calls for the entire and permanent renunciation of self. And finally, from the commentary regarding verse 33, so likewise, they write, as usual, Jesus clearly states the lesson. His parables are designed to teach. Discipleship involves the complete placing on the altar of all. A-L-L, -L, all that a man has in this life, plans, ambitions, friends, relatives, possessions, riches, anything and everything that might interfere with service for the kingdom of heaven. And so we find Jesus speaking, but seek ye what? First, the kingdom of God and his, and how much? Amen. You see, Christ gave his best. Who are we to give less? Just do it. Yes, please, take a close look in the mirror, the mirror of the word of God. Be convinced that the only way to rid yourself of this self-deceit is to give it up. Let your surrender be complete. 
Lay down your unclean weapons before a new master and Lord. And as you bow your face to the ground of humility like Ezra, Christ will give you the confidence to align yourself with a new army. The army of the Lord of hosts will be your new allegiance. Your new captain will outfit you from the mighty anointed armory of the Almighty. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. The hardest thing to do is most likely the best thing to do. The hardest thing to do is most likely the best thing to do. And so Ezra faced a moment of truth. I believe it was the hardest moment for the returnees, those who came from Babylon. Israel must come face to face with the fact that they have not returned their heart to God. They may be in Jerusalem and restored the temple and the wall of the city, but they have yet to let go of the things they have been holding on to. A very deep and emotional connection. Strange wives. Indeed, very strange wives. And some have even had children with this union. Strangeness goes even deeper, deeper than it fears at first glance. It goes to the very heart of raising a generation into the strangeness and the wickedness of a dark world, influencing those young offspring. Shachaniah pointed to this union with darkness as the very thing that brought captivity to Israel and destruction to Jerusalem in the first place. Syncretism, dualism, compromise. Have they surrendered? Have they really given it up? So now, in this narrative, comes the break point. Divorce. Now the Hebrew word for divorce derives from two words, to cut and to sever. To cut and to sever. Meaning to break all relationships. Now the Lord saw this moment coming, and so he pronounced in Deuteronomy 24, we read, where God allows those who sinned by joining in ungodly marriages to dissolve the illegal contract. The pagan woman could be sent back to her home with a bill of divorcement, allowing her to remarry, just as if she had not been. That's verse 4. Just, get that now, just as if she had not been. She was free to marry another. And so it is. If we divorce ourselves from this present evil world, from strange wives, we are free to marry another, none other than Christ, our redeeming kinsman. When then, we then become like Ruth, the bride of Boaz. Like Ruth, who left everything behind to become the progenitor of the Messiah. Such is the grace of God. Such is the love of God. But the break must be made. The Lord has said, give it up. Give it up. Everything must be pinned to the cross of Christ. The prejudice, the hate, the idolatry, and idolatry. Evil thoughts. The grudges. Oh, the grudges. These are some of the things we've been married to all our lives. They have to be let go. The Lord challenges us again. Give it up. Give it up. But to give it to whom? Give it up to him, to Messiah, the anointed one. He is the one who paid the price that we might live again if we would but surrender the captain to the captain of our salvation. He will accept us 
as we bow before the foot of the cross with all our hearts and accept him as conqueror, victor over the blackness of our soul. Let Christ break your heart in so many alabaster pieces and let the sweet oil of your repentance become his trophy of his holy love. Oh, please give it up. Give it up to him. He is waiting, even knocking at the door of a reprobate church. <clears throat> lukewarm, oh God, lukewarm. All he wants us to do is to answer the knock and let him take over our lives as victor. Oh, let the king of glory come in. Oh, let him crown, oh, let us crown him with so many crowns. As the song goes, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne. Hark, how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake, my soul, and sing of him who died for thee. And hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Let him wear holiness unto the Lord upon his brow as our great high priest. And our lives be jewels upon his crown as king of kings as we walk with him all the days of our life. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace toward men of good will. This is the only peace we can have. When we surrender to his terms, divorce ourselves from the world. Oh, please, let him be victorious as we give it up. Give it up. Give it up to him. Let him be the priest of your past the potentate of your presence, and the hope of your future. He alone is able to transform the darkness of my heart to change my life from lasciviousness and wickedness into a consecrated heart to prune us and shape us so that the fruit of the Spirit may flourish. The greatest of these fruits are what? Love but not just any kind of love. The New King James renders that same word, how? Charity. Why charity? Because when you give that kind of love, you give up something of yourself. The love that cost you something, just like Jesus. It cost him something precious to save your soul. It's the kind of love that just never gives up. You can read that in 1 Corinthians 13. Oh yes, how loud the clamorous and clamorous is our life when we do not have love. When our charity is so frail and false. Oh, but when the Lord of hosts comes in and he melts our heart, we can love again. We can give our lives away to the only one who will take us back. What are you holding on to? What is it that trips you up? What is it that can keep you from the kingdom? Oh, glory to God. Let it happen soon. Let it happen soon as we give it up to him. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Perhaps now we can understand why Shekhanai encourages Ezra to take legal action that goes below the surface of our secret sin. Not only are we to divorce strange wives, but we must cleanse our hearts from coveting them. And so the commandments of the Lord are vindicated as just and right and true. Remember, it is a law that ordains a substitute, a redeemer. According to the law of God, a sacrifice must be made just as Abraham took his son Isaac up the hills of Moriah. And as a young man asked his father, here's the wood and the fire, where's the sacrifice? And with all heart and faith, he said, the most powerful statement ever spoken in the word of God. What did Abraham say? The Lord himself. The Lord himself will provide the sacrifice. 
And so it is in Hebrews 11:19 we understand that Abraham saw more. He saw the resurrection from the dead. He knew that life could be restored. You see, there's nothing too dead that Jesus cannot rise from the ground. You may think that you're hopeless and lost and dead. Oh, but if you give your heart to the Lord, will he raise it up? Will he give you a new life and start afresh? When he calls your name, Lazarus, come forth. Will you desire to stay in the grave? Or come forth as he commanded you. You see, God can give more than what you give up. God can give more than what you give up. Let's go to another account. In Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 25. We're not going to read it, but I'll summarize it for you. Here we find the king of Judah, Amaziah, while he's organizing his army, determined that a 300,000-man army was too small to secure the kingdom. He feared this number was not enough to do the job. So he hired 100,000 mercenaries, men of Israel, Ephraimites, and he paid them 100 talents of silver. Take note, 100 talents of silver. That's 7,500 pounds of silver, and at the going rate, you know, silver is sold by the ounce, right? That is valued in today's dollars, a million and a half dollars. But after this is said and done, the man of God appears on the scene. And he says, he rebuked him. And he said, do not join yourself with these ungodly men. They'll pull you down. Worse, they will turn on you. Get rid of them. Give it up. A hundred talents of silver. And when Amaziah protested, saying, well, what about these 100 talents? I just paid them. And so we find in verse 9 what the man of God said. The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. The man of God pointed straight to the cross and said, the Lord is able to give you more than anything you have given up. He is able to save your soul. He is able to save you. If you give it up, Christ will take you up. If you give it up, Christ will take you up. It's amazing to me, 300 years later, almost to the year, a King Artaxerxes of Mede, not only provided tax-exempt status to Ezra's company, I thought that was a pretty cool thing, to the, the company of returning exiles. But he provided, this pagan king provided wheat and wine and, get this, and oil, and get this, 100 talents of silver. 300 years later, did God return? But this wasn't the most valuable thing he gave to the children of Israel returning from Babylon to Palestine. You know what that was? More valuable than silver and gold? Any, any guesses? Huh? It was salt. Salt. And it wasn't given by quantity, it was given in unlimited quantities. Yes, when God decrees divorce, he also seasons the sacrifice with salt. His amazing grace. Salt heals, salt seals, and salt protects. Yes, dear family, God's grace is given without measure. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Now you know why every sacrifice is seasoned with salt. What is 100 talents of silver to you compared to eternity? What is, it, what is it you are holding on to that would keep you from eternal life? 
Oh, bless God, we must give it up. Nothing in this world will last forever. It will all perish in the flames and fire of God's righteous judgment. And what is heaven compared to a little grudge? Oh, my. Or to a new car or a family or some fancy thing that you desire with all your heart? What is it compared to? <laughs> There's no comparison whatsoever. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 496, paragraph 1 reads, I hope you get this. Do not flatter yourselves if, that if you should yield the truth, all obstacles to your acquiring property would be removed. Satan tells you this. It is his sophistry. If God's blessing rests upon you because you surrender all to him, you will prosper. If you turn from God, he will turn from you. His hand can scatter faster than you can gather. What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? It is time. It is time to give it up, to consider our ways. I've heard the call. This is not just about my diet. It's about my ungodly appetites. I must give it up, Amen. give it all up. When Ezra stood up and demanded action, all the people, get this, the whole congregation stood up. And now, remember, it was raining and they were shivering, cold. They were outdoors. And they coveted to give it up. They coveted. People swore an oath. You get that? They swore an oath. And so must we. There is no better solution to sin than to pin it to the cross of Calvary and take up my cross and live for my Master and Lord. Give it all up. What is hindering your walk? What bonds are constraining you? What relationship? is killing you. This is his plea. Give it up. Give it all up. Christ will receive your sacrifice and place it upon the brazen altar of his grace to be consumed by the fires of his forgiveness. Then you will hear the words of your master, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Or... Dear family, please do not hesitate. Listen to the sure voice of Shachaniah when he says, Be of good courage and do it. Be of good courage and do it. Give it up. Amen. We look for that moment. Oh, we look for that moment when you split the skies and you call your bride home. Let nothing hinder us, O oh Lord. We sit before the great feast, the bride. As we come before you, Lord, this evening, as your very own, cleanse us from everything that would hinder us. As we go forth, with full expectation, knowing full well that we can be and participate of the marriage feast of the Lamb. Thank you, Lord. Guide us now as we go forth and pray, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.